All right, kids, no camera today. I got a quickie for you. A quickie about Ricky and Vicky. But before we do that, we got to go back in time. The year was 1986. In 1986, Atari put out a new game console. We also introduced the next generation of video game systems. It was called the Atari 7800. The new 7800. And it was an immediate smash hit. And it bombed like Hiroshima. On the interior, the 7800 was just a souped up 2600. Let me put it this way. The 7800 was the first apology console. The oops my bad version of the 5200. It was smaller, lighter, tinier, more compact, more portable, and those are all the same fucking thing. And the game we're going to be talking about today is not an original Atari 7800 game from the 80s, but a brand new Atari 7800 game from 2018, December in fact. It's called Ricky and Vicky. Here we go. So let's start off with how I found out about this game. I found out about it from Slow Beef. Long retired from Retsupray fame, he spends a lot of his time doing Twitch streams. But his Retsupray and escapades have not been forgotten. Especially by, I don't want to screw up his name, so I'm just going to say his Twitter handle, Tailchow. Tailchow remembered the old Ridley voice that him and Diabetes spam together on their Metroid Let's Play, as well as their other M video. Roll me that clip. He's sitting there flapping up. <laughs> I'm just desperate at this point. I've fought you a dozen fucking times. I can't see. I'm just going to claw the air in front of me. <laughs> Ooga booga. I'm Ridley. Ooh, are you scared, Samus? <laughs> and Tell Chow thought there was nobody better to do the voice of the antagonist of his Ricky and Vicky game for the trailer of the video than Slow Beef himself. Dragon, demon lord of inconvenience. And you just won an exclusive invitation to my secret base at the center of the earth. But come on down if you ever want to see your disgusting kids again. <laughs> ah, delicious. delicious. And it's here that we get our first taste of what Ricky and Vicky is like. And this is the two player mode of it, which is actually the main game. Anyway, Ricky and Vicky is a puzzle game. A puzzle game that can be played with one player or two. Both versions of the game have different puzzles to solve and levels to go through, and even different bosses to fight. So if you play it on two player, you get a completely different experience than if you played one player. And even though it's built on the Atari 7800 hardware, you don't have to have an Atari 7800 to pick this game up. It's actually available on Steam on its own emulator built specifically for it. And it wouldn't be a working man game if it didn't have a working man price and it ain't but 10 bucks. And that's not including Steam sales. So that's how cheap it is. A heck of a lot went into making this game look so good. If you have seen the Atari 7800 games and what they look like, you'd look at this game again and wonder why it isn't an NES game. Because for one thing, the sound and music sound way better than any 7800 game you've ever heard, if you've even heard a 7800 game. This game didn't push the boundaries of a 7800, it broke them. And to tell you all about it, I got an interview with Tail Chow himself to tell me every little detail on how the game was made. But before we get into that, let's play it. And now the plot. The Misery Dragon of Inconvenience has stolen your kids and you gotta get them back from him by solving puzzles and that's it pretty simple huh not exactly rich lore but 80s games didn't have very rich lore dude this is a totally deep hole yeah and so the game begins and the first thing you're greeted with is this jazzy sounding 8-bit tune So as you can see, the object of the puzzles is pretty simple. You just grab keys. When you grab all the keys, you go to the next level. Easy, right? You can use the boxes found in the game to jump to higher heights in places you can't get to. You can also use it as a weapon, as something to block something with. There's a lot of multiple uses for the box. Also, you see this? This is a very important mechanic in the game. 
you respawn in the opposite side of the wall you went through. This also works for the boxes, and you end up having to use that to your advantage in many puzzles. See, here I'm using the mechanic to make a platform with a box to get on the other side of the screen to get the key. Now, as for the bosses, well, the bosses have this certain pattern they all go through, and if you can memorize that pattern, it's a lot easier to defeat them. Other times, learning a pattern won't help you at all, and you'll just die and die and die and die and die and die and die 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 first and maybe the second level seems pretty easy to begin with the second starts to tease your brain a good bit but the third level and everything after that leans you over a table and beats your ass with a stick and that's why Dut exists. If you're not worried about score and just want to complete the game, Dut will take your score to zero and you can have infinite lives, but you won't have a score. Some people may not care about that and it doesn't change the ending of the game, but this game does cater towards speedrunners and completionists too, so you have the option to have just three lives. And if you go that route, you can actually sell some of your score for extra lives. And now that you know the gist of it, here's my interview with the creator, Tail Chow, to tell you even more in-depth story about this thing. So a couple of years ago, I was really into like co-op design, especially for two-player games, mm -hmm. because this seemed to be something that there were a lot of experiments with yeah. 20, 30 years ago, but it never really expanded into a big genre. So like we have a lot of team co-op games, like there's Overwatch and Counter-Strike and stuff like that oh, yeah. where you work collaboratively with a bunch of people to accomplish a common goal, but there's not as many with two players. The one that most people remember is World of Illusion on the Sega. Mm -hmm. So like, I thought that dynamic was kind of cool, where like you could have one player go at something individually, and there'd be interesting problems for them to solve, but then you could bring in the second player and the mechanics wouldn't change. Their presence would make a huge impact in how you play and what you can do. How long have you been working on the, the game as a whole? So the, uh, I think the, I first drafted the design in like December of 2014. So with the ship date, it's pretty much exactly four years. I gotta say this about, about the game. It's, uh, you say it's, it's on Atari 7800, but it, it far surpasses anything that looks that looks like it was available on the 7800 <laughs> i mean you've got these these really nice graphics sound color everything looks more nes than it does 7800 how were you able to do so much with that platform well we used it in a very different way than a lot of the developers were back in the day and a lot of people are now um, the, the Atari is pretty capable and like when I first played it, I was kind of underwhelmed and I looked at like the programmer's manual and it didn't really match up. I, I think the big difference in terms of like what Ricky and Vicky does versus what other games do is we actually designed a new memory mapper. So like on the NES, Nintendo made MMCs, like they had the MMC 1, 2, 3, blah, 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 mm -hmm. which kind of uh, complement like what the base console can do. And Atari never really did any of that. I kind of looked at what what I wanted to do with the game and what the hardware had available and how we could, you know, best enhance it. So it's a, it's a heavy cartridge. So like there's an extra audio processor in there, there's extra memory and the graphics better. Okay. But it's still it's still the Atari. Oh yeah. So uh um... You say, you say there's an extra audio processor. I noticed that the music sounds really good for something that the 7800 <laughs> would do, so I, I reckon something had to be different about it. Well, well, Tad was a really good composer, Rush Jet, so like that, that helps a lot. But um, we basically took a little microcontroller, and I had some Windows software that would render audio, and so we dropped it on there. So this is, you know, it's, it's pretty overpowered for what's in the car, like considering the date of the hardware, but... It's kind of necessary because there's not much in the Atari in terms of sound. Uh, was there a particular reason you you chose the 7800 as a platform? Was it was it the challenge to make a? <laughs> was it that challenge, or was it because like it's near and dear to you or something? Well, there's, there's a reason. It's not a really good one though. So like, oh. um, 
when uh, uh, when I, I designed the game first and then picked the hardware. So, like, what happened is I, I had the, the puzzle design, like, out on paper. I think much of it when I first came up with it. It's like, I don't know if people are actually going to want to play this. And I program for old hardware a lot as a hobby. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, looking, it's like, well, let's let's see if I can get it to run on something. So like, I want something that has a 320 pixel horizontal resolution so I can make the characters expressive. And uh, something that has two controller ports so you can play with a friend. It's the whole two player element. Mm-hmm. Oh, we could do the Sega Genesis, I mean the Atari. Um, and my friend got the 7800, like, when we were in middle school and we played it, and it's like, I, I read about, like, how it's this amazing arcade machine on the internet, and it didn't really seem to deliver that when we tried it. Mm-hmm. Again, it's like, this is kind of lousy. And that same friend kind of got sick of the console, and he's like, I don't want this anymore, I'm going to throw it away, do you want it? And I'm like, okay. And so it sat in a drawer. And I'm like, I got to do something with this, otherwise I have to throw it away. And then I'm like, well, why don't I try and write the game for it? And now here we are. So it it happened from a console that was given to you, basically. Yes. That, that's a so this is this pretty interesting story. Man's fault. <laughs> so um, let's talk about uh, Ricky and Vicky themselves and their character design. Uh, now you Sorry. told me that you did all the artwork for Ricky and Vicky. That's correct. Yeah, that's right. I was, well, you're a pretty good artist in that, at, I gotta say. Yeah. Well, what was your main inspiration for them and their look as far as as far as their character design and all? I wanted them to be easy to read on the screen. Cause I knew pretty early that like you, we'd have a fixed, uh, there'd be no scrolling and we'd have fixed screens uh, for each of the puzzles so you could see everything. And because of the design where you'd have to be moving the boxes around and there'd be two players and the enemies could move stuff around. So I made them foxes because, I mean, they're they're bright orange. It's the most obnoxiously visible animal you could get. Oh, yeah. And um, then I wanted them to kind of read distinctively from each other. So we gave Ricky the, um, the greenish blue nightcap and Vicky the red hair and the red shirt so that you could pick them out against each other easily and against all the enemies. Um, and we kept them like very simple in terms of personality, so it'd be easy for like players to kind of impose themselves on them. Hmm. Personality is mostly based upon my parents. Oh, yeah. I, I kind of it kind of reminds me of stuff like um, if you remember Chip and Dale on the NES. I bet a couple of people have yeah. brought that up, and and Mario Brothers, the arcade game. Yeah, but the the big one actually, like, um, because the game changed a lot, like, since the the first inception. Mm -hmm. If you look at the the art design, some of the older assets, they look a lot like Bubble Bobble. I saw that in there too, kind of a kind of yeah. a bubble bobble so, inspiration. Makes a lot more sense if you think about it, because you you with like the way you play the game and the way the story unfolds, mm-hmm. the it, it you can tell it takes a lot from Bubble Bobble. And as it went on, we drifted more away from that. But you can kind of see in a lot of the designs that um, that that old title of game did a lot of did a lot of inspiration on it. Mm-hmm. I like the humor in the story too. I won't I won't give much of it away, but I like how <laughs> how like how like the the main antagonist is called the the misery dragon of of yep. uh, misery, the demon lord of inconvenience. Inconvenience. There we go. The demon lord of inconvenience. He's just all around something that causes a lot of annoyance. <laughs> not not, <laughs> well, not even. his job. He's very good at it. Not even, not even despair, pain, or torture. Just annoyance. <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, and uh, and he'll cause as much annoyance as you let him. Uh huh. That's exactly right. And on the trailer, we hear freaking slow beef from Retza Prey, which I yeah. thought was a really cool cameo, considering the antagonist, antagonist is a dragon. So I can totally, totally right. hear that Ridley voice coming out of him just right out, right out the gate. Right. Well, and the, the thing is, like when we when I first started writing the character, mm-hmm. like it was straight up designed for that voice. So <laughs> I didn't know if we were going to be able to get slow beef in on it, but he was willing to do it. Well, actually, the 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 trailer was like a last minute thing because originally I wanted to try and get him to do a voice sample. So like after you'd clear the game, um, then you get like a little quote for it's a living, like played out of the Atari. <laughs> but we ran out of space, 
we ran out of space. And I'm like, oh crap, we can't do it anymore. And I started editing the trailer. I'm like, it takes too long for someone to read the text. So why don't we have someone read it to it? I'm like, and I emailed Slow Beef. He's like, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Yeah. I'm like, awesome. So but that was, that, that worked out better than I thought it would. I guess it would have, would have and would have not been that great if it would have been on the cartridge because it would have been like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much or that digitized text. I mean, you've heard the NES try to do digitized audio, you know? Oh, totally. Well, a, a lot of that too is that like the, the voices take a lot of space. They do. And so if, if you want a good one, you got to sacrifice. Like in our case, we probably would have had to give up like maybe uh, 40 or 50 puzzles in order it to get a good It would have been a really short voice. game. <laughs> like, so the Steam version is out now. It came, mm. it came out in like what, December 2018 last month? That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, um, I want to ask you about the Windows version. Is it an emulator running the 7800 ROM, or is it built from the ground up? It is an emulator, but it has some extra stuff. So, like, if um, when you're playing the Windows version, like, it has saving and it's, it retains the high scores mm -hmm. and all that other stuff. So, it's an emulator, but the game is cognizant of when it's actually running in the Windows version. Uh -huh. So, it goes out and looks and says, like, Okay, am I running in the special emulator? Oh, okay, I'm going to use all these extra features. Technically an emulator, but it has little hooks in there, so like you can do the achievements and the saving and the extra features. So it's less a 7800 emulator and more a Ricky and Vicky emulator. Yeah, yeah. We we released the emulator. Um, like, it's it's kind of okay. It can run most of the library. Really? Um, but it was, yeah, it was just designed to run Ricky and Vicky. Oh. So. Well, there's that. That's pretty cool. The 7800 version, you're going to make an actual physical cartridge that will play on a real 7800. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, what it, what went into yeah. making that? Yeah, I, I can tell you plenty. I got around 600 of these in my living room. So. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, You've already got some made, huh? Yeah. So we, we I actually wanted to release the cartridges on the same day. Hmm. But like we ran into so many delays that like it's it was too much, and so we had to to pull it back, and then we had to pull it back again. Um, but I'm hoping to get that done soon. So with, with the cartridges, um, because we had custom hardware, we had to make new boards, uh, new plastics, new everything. So my friend Tito did the PCB design, and so he actually made 600 boards like in his house on a hot plate, and they ended wow. up turning out really well. Well, that's pretty darn cool. Um, yeah, so the, it's not just the cartridge though. Like you, you get the whole box with the little pamphlet, Misery Land, and some other bonus features. So we're trying to J just like go how all you would have bought it in 1983 or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, I don't just want it to be like you're just getting a novelty cartridge and you slam it in the Atari and you play it for five minutes, but you you get the whole experience of like. It's not just the game, but you you're getting a an invitation to Misery Land. So the manual is written as if it's like a tour guide. Oh, that's cute. That's probably how yeah, it yeah. would have been done back then. Yeah, exactly. Like that's that's the sort of stuff I, I miss from a lot of the physical packaging we used to get. Like especially from the computer games. Oh yeah. Because it wasn't it wasn't just a manual, it was like it was an extension to the game because we couldn't fit all that content in yeah. in the cartridge. Yeah, game manuals used to be extremely cool. You'd have all these little illustrations right. that weren't anywhere else but in that book. Yeah. Like that and I, I wish we had more time like to, to make the manual elaborate. Like I wanted to put a little comic in there, but we, we couldn't do it. Well, I bet it's like, going to uh, be good. We'll see. <laughs> It'll be done. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, do you have a release date on the 7800 version yet? Not yet. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get it out like early February. We we announced January 14th when when we first announced the, the game itself. But like, uh, I'm not sure if you, you heard about like um, a streamer, uh, Mountain Bank. He ran into a soft lock issue. Oh. So we had to go back and patch that, which is fine on the Windows version. We just push a new build. But you got to rebuild that cartridge with the cartridge. In. Really, like we can reflash them. So there's a way to like you can put the cartridge in write mode and then update it. Oh. And so like that's already set up. But because of the delay, like I want to do another like week or two of QA 
like just to make sure we didn't miss anything else. So, all right, like it, just just give it like so the little time, the extra time benefits. Well, I gotta say it's the, pretty it's pretty amazing that you're going through with that. I mean, it's always neat to see stuff like that, like a a, a retro version of an old game or, yeah. or a new game. Well, then, well, I'm not the first to do it, and it's it's becoming more common now. But like I, I lucked out that this is the second time I've done it, so because it is a lot, and there's a lot that can go wrong. Yeah, you worked on another game before that. It uh, what was it called? Bazaku on the Lynx, yeah. On the Lynx. I did that. Yes, I did that with uh, Super Fighter Team. I see. Cool. Are there any other uh, projects or ideas you have planned for either Ricky and Vicky, or maybe like a new release? Is there other things you got on your table right now? A lot of, yeah, definitely. A lot of it depends upon like how Ricky and Vicky does. Mm -hmm. So like, I really do want to do a Switch port of it because I feel like that would work better than the PC version, given that, you know, the thing has two controllers attached to it. That was my, my big concern when we first released it. You, you have to do local co-op and it's like, you got to get two people to sit in front of a PC. Oh, yeah. And even though we have a lot of streaming options now, tested it out with the Nvidia Shield and all that yeah but we we made sure it worked with like the shield and the um a couple other options but i feel like uh it's it's still kind of uh, fussy to to get two people to sit in front of a pc yeah that and seems with to a be... switch it'd be much more streamlined yeah that seems to be the controversial thing right now is that uh there is no online two-player unless you want to do something yeah. like parsec or something but, um, yeah, yeah. But it, like, I, it's kind of, I, it. I understand it's, it's why you did it because it's kind of like, you know, the limitations of the cartridge, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, well, in this case, it's like more of a limitations of the emulator in our budget. I see. Uh, and it, like, you could argue that, like, well, it's supposed to be a game about cooperation, so we should get together and then play the game. But, you know, it, there's just so much you can do with, with the time you have. I got you. I know. So I, I have had my friends get together and use Parsec to play together, though. Oh, and it's been it's been a really fun, uh, really fun little thing that they've done. Also, I know a couple of guys that have found a way to play Rick, Ricky and Vicky on two player by themselves by just playing oh, yeah. by playing with the bind, the controller binds. Like they yeah. they make Ricky and Vicky d they follow each other, kind of like the ice climbers. They're kind of just right beside each hey. other all the time. Yeah, Tad was doing that when, when he was testing the game. Mm -hmm. He managed to clear a couple bosses in two-player mode uh, by that. And I figured, like, maybe after a month, like, after we shipped, someone would, would start doing that and, like, rip the game apart. Because we designed it for, for speedrunning, and I, I really wanted to see what people would do with it. But then uh, Mountie Bank, who, who also found the soft luck bug, like he he was the one that the first one I think that cleared it in two player mode with one controller, mm -hmm. and that like I saw that and it was like in, I think it was like days after we shipped and I'm like oh my god this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> had to be really humbling I tell you yeah yeah like I, I knew it was gonna happen just not that fast we're reaching the uh, we're reaching the hind end of this interview if people want to keep up with news about the game or your stuff uh, where should they go what website should they go to or social media whatever well the well the company website is penguinet.net mm -hmm. which which I'll hopefully redo in like that's because the layout is so old and nasty. Well, it uh, um, I saw the website. It 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 fits the uh, it fits the aesthetic really. <laughs> to be nice, um, yeah. So that that's the main thing. So if, whenever anything that new that's going to happen with the game, it'll it'll be announced there. Also, my YouTube and Twitter, which is just if you look if you search for Tail Chow, you'll probably find me. Well, that um, that sounds wonderful. But uh, one thing I can say is next Tuesday we're putting up the Humble Widget. So in case you don't want Steam, you can just download a standalone. Oh, so you can get it on what, Humble Bundle? So just the little, you know, punch your credit card in and download it. So that'll go up next Tuesday, and then we'll oh, go from there. Okay. I really yeah. hope the game does good, and... Uh... This is my this is my part of signal boosting about it, and uh, you, 
Nice to meet you, and you have an ab- you have an absolutely wonderful day. If you'd like to check out Ricky and Vicky for yourself, I have the Steam link below in the description. I also have the Penguinet website where you can find out more information about the game and maybe some information about the 7800 version. Well, I hope you enjoyed the episode, everybody. Uh, this is something I want to get into a little bit more. Games that don't cost a lot of money. I mean, I, I'm called Working Man Games. I ought to offer reviews on games that are cheap, you know, but still good, while still showing off the games that fill weird niches. There's a word. Niches. Niches. Well, anyway, I'm already working on the next Working Man, so y'all will see that soon. Till then, follow me on Twitter, donate to my coffee, K-O-F-I. I I use that instead of Patreon so you don't have to do a monthly pledge, and so you don't get scammed over and over by Patreon. If you donate money, I go buy games. Simple as that. Also, follow my Twitch channel. I got a Twitch channel, which I do streams every other week or so. I'll announce on my Twitter when I start streaming. And that's all I got that I really use. YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. Twit and Twitch. You can remember that, can't you? Twit and Twitch. Oh, and coffee. Twit, twitch, and coffee. My rambling's going on for too long. See y'all.